The Johnson Collection is, is really thrilled to welcome um, Jan Postma, a Spartanburg native and the CFO at, at MoMA, um, back to town along with his wife, Jane Panetta, who is an associate curator at the Whitney Museum of American Art. And they're going to talk tonight about how we can make collections matter in a modern age. Century that it wasn't until the 20th century that 
Um, museums really broaden beyond this idea of just a, a cabinet of curiosities or just simply classifying knowledge. And so that's actually interesting to think about as well. In fact, it was in 1929 that Rommel was founded. I want to just pause on the slide um, for a couple of minutes and the visual arts of our time. And I have arts of our time on the line too because it's very easy to think of art or collecting it into this very narrow painting and sculpture bucket. And in fact, uh, most of the objects uh, that I'm, I'm going to show are, in fact, are not painting and sculpture objects. It's only a very broad definition of, of visual art encompassing everything from painting, sculpture, photography, film, to even video games more recently. And this idea of art being available to anyone is, is super important. Mayall was one of the first artists to enter Roma's collection um, in 1930. And what's amazing about this is this work, uh, commissioned later in, in 1938 and completed um, in 1943, is still on view in the Mona Sculpture Garden today. It's a beacon of familiarity. If you're coming to the museum for the first time, you'll notice that if you're coming back, it'll always be there. And I think that that's, you know, again, something to help anchor people's visit to Mona. And since, since the uh, early collecting period, sorry, I'm in CFO, so I don't include like a data slide. <laughs> um, I don't expect everyone to understand this, but, but a couple of things I want to point out here is, and this is, um, this is actually a public data set that Mona releases, and I read some interesting articles about it, but essentially what you see is that um, each year, um, the, the way these axes work is the, the um, x-axis on the bottom is the year of the artwork that's produced, and the y axis is the year you acquire it. So there's this very high density um, on kind of the, the far right of the, of, of the slide here. And what's that, what that is showing is that MoMA is just very actively, actively acquiring and organizing its collection. In fact, um, we acquire an average um, at least one work per day, um, which is kind of an, an, an extraordinary view. And these works range from things that are very familiar to everyone. I, I think most people recognize the artist on this page. Uh, Jasper Johns, also in the Johnson collection here in Spartanburg, and, and of course a um, great Southern artist. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on, the, on these classics. Um, as well as works of art that are harder to understand. Um, and here on the left is essentially a snow shovel. This is rated high at MoMA in terms of one of the most perplexing pieces for people to understand. Um, but, the, but this is important because we don't expect actually every visitor to, to have a positive reaction to sort of the collection. In fact, if you have a visceral negative reaction, that's actually good too. The point is to have a reaction, going back to this idea of enjoying the art, whether positively or negatively, it is super, super important. And of course, Duchamp, um, that work on the right, not in Mona's collection, but I, I wanted to show it anyway. Um, this is obviously a standard issue, um, American Journal, um, flipped on its side. And a British newspaper uh, did a survey of art historians in England in 2004. Um, this was actually named the most influential work of modern art. Um, but if you think about it, it, it's not that surprising, right? Because the British have always really been jealous of American falling. <laughs> um, and so you, you see that that translates even into the art historical field. Um, and then you have, again, just again, trying to broaden everyone's uh, idea of what a collection can be. Um, these are works that, that are in as architecture and design. But in fact, also sold in our retail stores. And so anyone can simply um, purchase one of these products, um, and you're actually using modern and contemporary art. Um, you know, make your coffee and tea, sit in that nice chair, just enjoy it while you're reading the paper. Um, making coffee is actually tough in, in our household, Jan, a very different taste. Um, and last data slide, sorry. Um, so as MoMA has grown from sort of one object to 200,000 objects, um, the focus of the collection, and, and this is a, an important point, it's really been, the emphasis hasn't been on a specific geography, it's really been about time period, trying to stay current. And so our focus has really been global, and you can just see um, most of the work we've acquired here is still by American artists, but it really spans the entire, in the entire world. And I would actually not probably recommend that for most places because when you're when you're building a collection, focus is often the toughest thing, just having the ability to say no. And that's why 
When you think about the fact that there is modern and contemporary art museums in almost every city um, in the country or internationally now, the question is how many more of these do we actually need? And it's really refreshing when you think about a place like the Whitney focusing on American art, the Johnson Collection focusing on Southern art. This kind of, this kind of focus is super, super important as you're, as you're thinking about building and, and even using a collection. I'm now going to transition a little bit backwards into really three, three broad ways in which Lynch Mellon has used this collection over time. And I think these are just general ways that most institutions are using their collection, again, not limited to a specific place. And the first is in the building and the, and the surrounding community. You know, from the very beginning, Mama, crowds have actually been a problem in New York City. It's just kind of that old Yogi Berra phrase, no one goes there anymore, it's too crowded. We actually had to raise um, our admission price um, as early as 1930, one year after we opened, due to overwhelming demand. So we had to charge 50 cents during the last two weeks of the exhibit um, to run the crowds. But one of the ways, um, the, the, one of the reasons that there were crowds is because these exhibits were, were designed to be very accessible, to be open, to be something that anyone react, could react to. And what you're seeing on the screen here is an installation shot of an exhibition from 1944 called Our Closed Modern. This concept that clothes could be part of a modern and contemporary art collection um, was definitely key in keeping with the original mission of the moment, a very long definition of the visual arts. And you'll, um, you know, just to read from the press release, um, it says, the exhibition throws light upon a great number of mystifying, humorous, or shocking habits. It shows the present overburdened by the past, a needless waste of materials, and a superfluidity and obsolescence of detail, as well as arbitrary or uproarious malformation, it all forms a maze of the irrational and the accidental, a maze from which it is time to escape. It's a very provocative statement around clothes, and that clothes that you can you see on the back of the wall there, very anachronistic uh, gender, gender view. It says, the more helpless a woman, the more attractive she is supposed to be to man. To keep her from moving freely, he hampers her walk with anklets, stilts, Follow spurs and high heels. Um, so you, this was a, a, just an example of a very popular exhibition in 1940, 1944 that again anyone could enjoy. You didn't have to have this comprehensive background of the modern and contemporary art. But what Mama quickly realized, and, and I think what a lot of places have realized, is that a building or being in a place just isn't enough. Um, and so we started building up an active circulating exhibition program, and, and I'm showing two images from, a, from um, something called New American Painting, which um, was sent from MoMA to Europe in 1958-59. We know this today more, more by the term abstract expressionism. But this idea of broadening the impact beyond the community you're with by circulating your exhibitions around the world is one that's still powerful today. Um, and, and in fact, this was actually part of a larger, many have said that this was part of a larger cultural diplomacy around the Cold War, this, this idea of exporting American values. Even though this painting is, is by definition apolitical, a lot of the write-ups for, for the show emphasize the uncompromising individualism of the artist, and, and which was a very American thing at the time. And interestingly enough, um, Mama actually did not do another synthetic uh, painting show until just last year. So a huge amount of time elapsed between when this was circulated in 1958 and 59 until when painting itself was, was tackled again. And one thing I want to note, again, just circling back to the amazing resources here in Spartanburg, I was astounded um, in talking to um, David and, and Aaron and Lynn in, in terms of the Johnson collection. Right now, they have some of their exhibitions are planned on tour to 17 museums around the country, which, when you think about this idea of not being one of the place and having them back more broadly, that's, that's an extraordinary, extraordinary number. So let me turn now to the third leg of, of really how um, collections are used. We talked a little bit about this idea of place, then the way exhibitions could circulate around the world, but increasingly, you really since the invention of the internet, it's also been about making an impact of your art online and, and using that as a medium. And, and increasingly, that's what, that's what we've done. Uh, what you see on the screen um, is from one of our more recent shows called uh, Jacob Lawrence, the Migration Series. 
Um, and that actually will be on view in Washington, D.C. at the Phillips Collection starting in October for those who want to see it. Um, and some of these images are extremely powerful. I mean, this was an image made in 1941. You see the caption there, one of the largest race riots occurred in East St. Louis. East St. Louis being basically where Ferguson is today. Um, again, an example of a work from the past really speaking, as, speaking to us through a contemporary lens. But the real highlight here is um, where this had a, had a had the broadest reach was a very detailed and in-depth website and creative work. Um, and you can find it uh, in just a moment out of the migration series. So if you if you miss seeing it in person, that's okay. You, you may not have the same emotional resonance, but you could at least see the images online with research material. And, and I think that's really if you want to have if you want your collection to have an impact, that's the way to do it. And I, while, while I was thinking about this, I also um, what struck me was really. Here in South Carolina, the, the recent tragedy in Char Charleston and the artistic response to that. And again, looking at a work from the past, this is actually from the Johnson Collection, Diana Taylor, called Thomas Lyon Church, um, which I understand was one of the most um, commented and engaged upon works after the emotional events of Charleston, even here. And so a local example of really using your collection to have a powerful impact in the visual field even without um, being personally on view. And I, you know, I think this work really speaks for itself. I want to pause for a second um, before, we, before we transition um, back to where I began. So when we think about the, the different strategies for how a collection um, is being used, whether that's in the local community, circulating more widely, or even online, these three words that, that Alfred Barr started on with, enjoy, understand, and use, I still think are extremely valuable when we think about any work of art in a collection for having an impact on people. And what you're seeing on the screen, I'm sure everyone's wondering what in the heck is going on here. Um, this is a uh, sculpture by Pierre Huy, a French artist. And where the head is, is actually a live beehive. Um, this was, um, you know, we worked with a beekeeper in upstate New York to, to get the bees um, into place. And when you think about enjoying work of art, just knowing the backstory behind this is kind of fascinating. There's also a seven and a half hour video on YouTube where you can watch this theme. Not a lot of people have made it through the whole thing, but apparently, our analytics data suggested that some people had, I don't know who those people were, but um, it might have been soothing. Um, and we heard, the beekeeper remarked that he, he thinks that the bees seem pretty calm being in the luxurious setting of the normal sculpture garden. But again, knowing some of these stories make, make, work, make works of art uh, more, more enjoyable. And then again, um, understanding. Here, when, again, this is, we're using our collection. We have an exhibit up right now called Ocean of Images, um, new photography. A, a word from there is in, in the top of that. Um, but to broaden the, 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 um, uh, the effect of that, we also um, released a textbook at the same time called Photography of Moa, 1960 to today. And then just last week, um, launched a free course. Anyone can take this on uh, Coursera. Um, it's, in, it's in beta testing probably for a couple more days, but it's there. So if you have an interest in photography, um, I would encourage anyone in the room to sign up. Um, there's no grades, of course, but it's free. Um, and of course, there's there's a great quote um, there for the course. Photography is a foreign language; everyone thinks that they speak. Um, and so true in our in our Instagram culture of today. And I wanted to close again: enjoy, understand, and use with with, with this idea of use. This is the ad symbol. We all use it every day in email. Mom actually acquired it into his collection last year. Um, that was one of our most read blog posts. From a financial perspective, it was great, it was free. Um, but again, broadening the definition of art, a very democratic view, anyone can appreciate that this is, what an amazing invention, and our, and our curator writes, this was a design, this was a design decision of extraordinary elegance and economy. Repurposing an existing, available, and underutilized symbol to adopt a standard keyboard to a revolutionary new technology. 
And that's what was amazing about this. At the time, it was one of the most, one of the least used keys on the keyboard, of course. Not so much anymore. And I wanted to close again, um, going back to this idea of using collections online. Uh, this is an Instagram screenshot from MoMA. And what's interesting about this is, this is a work by William H. Johnson that MoMA acquired just, uh, just in the last month. The first work by this artist in our, in our museum collection. But right here in Spartanburg, in the Johnson collection, there are four works by this amazing artist that have been in the collection for some time. And so, what an amazing privilege it is to have access to that right here. At this point, I'm gonna transition a little bit and move beyond what I hope has been really a broad view of collecting ways to use collections back to the more specific and, and, and let Jane talk through some of the decisions decisions that Whitney had to make when they were reinstalling an entire collection, thinking back to the very first slide, a collection must be unified as a whole. And I think that's possibly the toughest thing to do. So let me turn it over to Jane. Thank you. that we all seem to be suggesting he was going to give the broad brush big picture thinking and I was going to deliver some more micro micro details or something but anyway um, that said I hopefully it won't feel that way but I am going to talk about um, the Whitney specifically and even within that talk about um, both the building a little bit because um, in this case I feel like our building and everything we thought about for the new building really related to the collection and our hopes for the Anyway, um, that said, I hopefully it won't feel that way, but I am going to talk about um, the Whitney specifically and even within that, talk about um, both the building a little bit because um, in this case I feel like our building and everything we thought about for the new building really related to the collection and our hopes for the collection specifically, and then segue to the opening show um, that was entirely the collection and, and talk a little bit about all the things we tried to do with that show and the ways in which the things we did, the questions it raised, I think will kind of propel the Whitney forward as we move ahead with the collection. Um, so the new building, for those of you that don't know, the Whitney opened we opened our new building on May 1st of this past year. This is a picture um, of the new building. And as I said, we opened with a collection show entitled America's Hard to See that filled the whole building. This was a big deal for us to make this move. This has been about that ethos, that idea really enabled us to make this move, which was not um, insignificant. Um, and just to, to remind you, this is a picture of both the new building uh, on the left-hand side and the old building that we were in on the right-hand side, built in 1966 by Marcel Breuer it's on 75th and Madison. So, you know, this slide, without even saying so too much, I think says a lot. Um, the old building, the Breuer building, was a fabulous piece of architecture, but it was a very closed building. It really functioned like a bunker, and our director would always say one thing he regretted about that building was when you were in the building, you didn't know where you were. You could be looking at art anywhere. You could be in Munich, in St. Louis, in Los Angeles. But there was very little that oriented you to the city. By contrast, uh, I think you can get a sense of this, that our new building is very different than that. Um, it's very much about kind of enabling these views to the city um, and, and, and really kind of engaging with those views, both by enabling people to look into the museum and for you to look out and kind of understand where you are when you're in the space. And this is a photograph I'm taking of the, of the reinstallation of the new building, but again, showing you, I think, this pretty unique relationship between indoor and outdoor space. So when you're in the building and spending time kind of through the galleries, very easily in the course of your trip through the museum, you can kind of slip out and have this outdoor view. You can step out onto a terrace. I'll show you those pictures more, that, that there would be this constant kind of ongoing fluidity between indoor out and outdoor space, indoor and outdoor vistas. Um, so this is a picture, a very famous picture, of um, Peggy Guggenheim's gallery in New York called Art of the Century. And this is a picture from the 1940s. And this, this space, this installation was uh, designed by Fred, Frederick Kiesler. And Peggy's Guggenheim's collection was um, very heavy in 
early surrealist work and surrealism works with kind of these biomorphic forms and Dali and Juan Miro, those artists. And so this installation very deliberately responded to that art, almost in a kind of exaggerated way, a way that we probably wouldn't be inclined to do now. That said, this was an image we always kind of came back to um, in presentations when we talked about the new building, that we really wanted the new Whitney to, to whatever extent possible to be a marriage of art and architecture. And I think kind of a historic example like this, again, an extreme example, provided us a way of thinking about this possibility and kind of staying true to the possibility. So one thing people have um, often asked me when I've talked about the new building is how could sort of the preeminent museum of American art have hired a non-American and Italian architect to design the new building. The building was designed with architect Renzo Piano, who may be a familiar name to many of you, and who has designed many museums. And that, that was a very important piece of the decision. When our director and the trustees began to think about who would they, who would they enlist to do this, they traveled the world, they looked at museums, they talked to other architects. And the person that seemed to have done the most successful job in terms of what they saw and what they heard, Renzo's name kept coming up again and again. And I'll just quickly show you two examples. This is the Centre Pompidou that he designed in 1977, somewhat controversial at the time. Uh, it's in the Marais neighborhood of Paris, and a lot of buildings were destroyed to build it. But I think the relationship between indoor and outdoor space, for those of you that are, have been there, as you ride the escalators up, you take in these views of the neighborhood and then of Paris skyline of Paris here, there's this real kind of fluidity between the space. Um, and it also is a very flexible gallery. So despite being um, almost more than 30 years old, almost 40 years old at this point, it's a building that, you know, I think s did a lot of things that interested us. And then in the United States, a building that I would say curators really love and artists love to work in is the Manila Collection in Houston, Texas. I think it's seen as really a very successful building, um, how the building kind of falls away and allows the art to sing and has very flexible gallery space, has skylights, and again, a lot of the signature things that Renzo's been interested in over time, this building is from 1987, we tried to bring to bear on the Whitney. <coughs> this is Jan's favorite slide in my presentation. Um, this is a slide, so how do you build a new building? And as I said, we really tried to think about the collection a lot. What were the collection needs and what did we want the galleries to feel like? So, and, and I think um, there, there's been kind of a, a big burst of new, build, new museum buildings in the United States, I say in the past 20 years, and that seems to be ongoing. And so, and we knew those all hadn't been totally successful. So I would say in our case, we really, to whatever extent possible, wanted to leave nothing up to chance. So to understand the size of the galleries we would want, how wide would we want the floor plates to be? How long? How, how flexible would we want them to be? How many galleries would we ideally envision on a floor? We found a big space in New York, the Armory Building on Park Avenue on the Upper East Side, and spent time with the architects there, mocking up with lasers and tape and things on the floor, the size, the potential size of the galleries. People walked the galleries, we cut them up to understand how they would feel for a particular exhibition. And really that was how we kind of came to this decision of, of what the galleries would feel like. That it wouldn't be um, you know, just about the site or just about some abstract idea of how big they should be, but what would the experience be? And what, how could work the biggest works of art in the collection? How, would, how could that kind of drive the discussion? And you can see this is on the fifth floor of, of the museum now. Um, is a almost 20,000 square foot column free gallery. And, and I think, you know, understanding how big this space could be really came very directly out of what we did at the armory. Um, similarly, we built mock ups of the galleries in Red Hook, Brooklyn. Um, so, with that's the flooring that's actually in the museum now. It included the ceiling grid. Um, the, uh, saying the relationship between the wall and the floor. And then once that was done, we actually brought artworks. These are three artworks from the collection, Carl Andre, Joe Baer, and Andy Warhol. We brought them out to Brooklyn and installed them in the space. So we could understand, okay, how do these works, you know, from different moments look on the floor? How do they look at, with this particular ceiling height? How do they interact with the, with the ceiling grid? Again, kind of leaving, to whatever extent possible, nothing up to chance. And then, um, you know, during the process of doing this research, we spent a lot of time, as I mentioned, at, at other museums. And you can see here, we really drilled down with something like ceiling height. I think that became very important to us. We have a collection that spans over 100 years. And, 
and kind of the relationship you want to have in a gallery, let's say to a Charles Birchfield watercolor versus a big Richard Serra sculpture, very different. You might want a very different ceiling height, very different floor plate. And so we looked at all these different museums, we're in all these different galleries, understanding the ceiling heights. And you can see we, we recorded this and kind of went back to the things we saw as successful and, and, and maybe less successful. And here's a picture of us mocking up the ceiling grid again in Red Hook. Um, so one really important piece of this building um, versus the Broder building, I talked about that being very closed. It also had really no outdoor space for sculpture. Um, and I think as we wanted, we have a collection of outdoor sculpture and we really didn't have a good place to showcase it. It's also something I think we hope to grow. So this is just a shot of kind of both the terraces in the new building, um, but on also these outdoor staircases. Again, really encouraging the visitor while you're there to have the experience inside for sure, but also have the chance to experience art and just to experience kind of vistas of the city. Um, and this is a picture of three David Smith sculptures we have um, on one of the terraces. Again, these are important works in our collection that we rarely have the right opportunity to show um, up at the Broder Building. So now with this new building with these outdoor terraces, this enables us to really showcase this artist that we've been very committed to um, and this work that he showed outdoors himself. He was always interested in the way this work interacted with natural light. He liked seeing them outdoors in these fields. So, you know, this was an example where we had this work and we didn't kind of have the, the honest or the right space in which to show it. Um, and the other thing about the outdoor terraces is it was really important to us to have the ability with the windows, have the flexibility to have the terraces function like outdoor galleries. And I'm just showing you here, um, this is a gallery of minimalist sculpture um, from the 1960s and 70s. And we had, for the opening show, we had work indoors, but then we also had an important work a Robert Morris sculpture outdoors. Um, and so we wouldn't have had room to show all of it indoors, but some of the sculpture could go outdoors so we could have this nice you know, space indoors, outdoors with the shades up in a way that we absolutely could not have had before. And also I think seeing something like Robert Morris, he was a sculptor that was very interested in industrial practices and, and bringing industrial materials into kind of the fine art conversation. Seeing that against the backdrop of the city, of the urban, um, seemed particularly fitting as well. And again, here's a Glenn Ligon sculpture, a, um, a neon sculpture, Negro Sunshine, which we installed at the end of one of the floors that people could see from all the way down the block. You could, when the trees were not covered with leaves, you could see it from almost two blocks away. Um, and so that was an important thing to us, a way to kind of entice people into the building to, for people to ask the question, what's going on in there? Um, and that even if you didn't come to the building, you could have some experience of art. And then the last thing we did, excuse me, is um, there's a very large terrace off of the fifth floor and um, we commissioned the painter Mary Heilman to do an outdoor installation, um, if you will, on that space for the opening. And we asked her, um, it's a big terrace, and we asked her to make kind of a social sculpture. Um, she made these terrific chairs um, that she deliberately installed. This is a view from one of the terraces above, and she deliberately kind of installed them as if they were a painting, you know, given the relationship with the colors. Um, but then, of course, people were able to move them around and to experience the space, sit there, look out at the city, um, and, and really have a kind of different relationship to the city and to the museum than anywhere else in the building. Um, so now I'm gonna segue to the collection and, and talk to you a little bit about um, the opening display. Um, the Whitney's collection is much smaller um, than MoMA's collection. It's about 22,000 objects, but still sizable. And um, in the Broder building uptown, for those of you who visited there, there was limited space for the permanent collection. Unlike a place like MoMA or the Met, where there are many dedicated galleries to the collection, where visitors could return kind of consistently and see familiar friends like Starry Night um, or Demoiselle Davignon, we didn't have that situation exactly. Um, we often used the fifth floor of the building for the permanent collection, but we had nothing dedicated. And I think we began to feel that, um, you know, given the size of our collection, 22,000 objects, you know, we had a responsibility to make a space where more of that could be on view regularly. But what did it mean for us to have collected that if so little of it was shown, um, shown so often? So that was a big piece of kind of why, um, why we decided to make the move. 
And as I mentioned earlier, for the opening, um, there was a lot of discussion, not, not that I was involved in all of it, but you know, I later learned there was a lot of discussion, what would we open with? Um, and you can imagine there might have been a temptation, let's open with a big Edward Hopper show. Let's open with an artist we're very associated with, a big Calder show, and kind of make a splash that way. But I think the feeling was, given that we decided to make this move largely to showcase the collection, and what made the most sense was to fill the, all the galleries, the four floors of galleries and the lobby gallery and all the terraces with work from the collection. Um, so that was a big undertaking. Again, unlike MoMA, where so much of the collection for the Met has routinely been on view, for example, well, that was not the case for us. So there were a lot of unknowns about the collection. People hadn't seen things, things had not been shown. So in order to do this, in order to show the 650 objects through the four floors of the building, five floors of the building for the opening, we had to start about three years out to begin a very comprehensive look at, at the collection um, through the whole span of 115 years. And we did that, and this was somewhat unusual, we did that as actually a large team of seven curators. Um, and when, when I was first invited to, to work at the Whitney full time and I was told how many people were gonna be on the team, I thought, oh God, that will progress like at a snail's pace. That will be impossible. How will we ever kind of come to decisions and we'll be arguing. And, but, it, but almost because it was a three-year process, I think we got into a good groove and really managed to make um, decisions by consensus, but we really together as a group of seven, we systematically um, went through the whole 115 years of the collection, essentially, many hours in one conference room, you can imagine. Um, so one quick thing I'll say, this is the collection ran chronologically from the top floor down, and we titled the exhibition America's Hard to See, and I think, um, this is something we struggled with a lot. It comes from both a Robert Frost poem and an Emil D'Antonio film from the 60s, um, much more kind of politically charged um, suggestion through D'Antonio. But I think we thought this, this worked really well for us for multiple reasons. I think, and I'll walk you through this a little bit, the more we looked at the collection, we noticed that the Whitney's collection um, had a very consistent kind of tough political thread through it. Um, there's like early social realist work from the first half of the century, um, a lot of work from the 60s around Vietnam and the civil rights movement, and then even more recently, I would say since, since September 11th, a lot of tough work that dealt with what happened on September 11th, the recession, climate change, all of those things. So that the Whitney had really never shied away from that, and I think that we saw as a unique strain of the collection and, and something we felt was important to, to reflect in the opening display that in a lot of ways, the collection had functioned in sort of a conscience of American history over the past 115 years. So it felt, um, it felt like a, a right title in that way. It also felt like a right title because the collection is big and disparate. And as I mentioned, 22,000 objects in the collection, we got that list down to about 2,000 objects that we really wanted to show, but then of course knew we only had room for 650. So what we realized is whole chunks of our collection, whole chunks of history were gonna have to come out. So the difficulty of kind of presenting any narrative that was comprehensive was a difficult thing. And so this idea that America is hard to see, kind of any one continuous narrative is kind of an impossible thing to put forth. And I think it was also a title that we thought would signal to people that there would be future iterations of the collection, that it would be hard to, it's hard to see, and therefore you need to see more versions of it, so to speak. So, um, you know, Yazian knows well, we really, we struggled with the title and, and we struggled with whether or not we put the word collection into the title. But I think, as I said, we felt like the show was about our collection, but also kind of about American history and, a, and the history of American art in a, in a particular way. Um, so as I mentioned, like, I'll have to excuse the next few pictures. These are not very good photographs I took on my iPhone, but this is us in storage and um, a few of my colleagues. And as I said, we spent three years on this project and we went through the collection decade by decade. So we spent a lot of time using our digital database to understand, okay, you know, between 1900 and 1910, what do we have? And we looked at those images as checklists, but then we knew we didn't know so many of the work, many things we hadn't shown in decades. So we knew we couldn't just rely on, you know, a tiny, a uh, tiny JPEG, we would have to go into storage and look at things in person. Um, and so this is 
These are photographs from the Whitney storage, and we spent many, many full days there just looking at work after work. And it was so interesting, things we thought would be fabulous that we would absolutely show. Some instances when we saw them in person, we were less impressed. We changed our minds. By contrast, other things that we were not expecting to be so kind of wowed by once we saw them in person, um, you know, we thought, oh, we're definitely showing this. So it, it kind of raised a lot of interesting questions for us as curators, as an institution, about the need to kind of make make your collection accessible both to the public but to the people working with it so we kind of know know what we're dealing with. Um, and then a couple things in this photograph, once we did the kind of preliminary pass through the collection, as I said, we got from about, uh, we, we got it to about 2,000 objects and we began to make these boards of different kind of big ideas that you see here, you know, 1950s figuration, 19, 1930s uh, political work, um, early modern forms, these kind of big ideas that we began to see as chapters or possible galleries. And we put them on these boards and we'd have these meetings where we kind of debate which works, which works we would keep, which chapters we would keep. Um, and then eventually, of course, we had to turn to the models of the gallery floors, and this is what you see here. And the person in the blue sweatshirt is actually Renzo Piano, and that's one of the reasons I chose this image. One thing that was really interesting and and ultimately somewhat surprising to me is the willingness Renzo, the architect, you know, he's a kind of world-renowned, very successful architect, is willing to sit in on some of our conversations. Um, when we began to talk about, okay, the fifth floor, it's 18,000 square feet, we have all these ideas we want to cram in. What's the kind of reasonable number of galleries we could cut this into? And as an architect, he has a kind of natural appreciation, understanding of how to use space in a way we are not architects. We we didn't um, pretend that we had. So we were able to have a, a really beneficial conversations there. Um, you know, he didn't know that much about the collection, but he was very open without being kind of insistent that we stick with his plan. And I think in the end that really um, benefited benefited the installation. And you can see this is this became our war room of sorts where we spent many full days. Um, these are the boards um, with these different ideas from the collection. and. We spent a lot of time playing with um, playing with the models. You can see this is our chief curator, just to give you a better sense of these um, to scale models, which the architects would build for us. And you can see we, we you know, in designing and understanding the walls, we would put these little maquettes up of the artworks and try to understand: okay, is this enough space um, to the from the elevator to the front wall? What kind of experience do we want to have? Is this enough space for this very large artwork? Um, so we really, you know, we changed these walls many, many times. We moved the works around many, many times, but by kind of using the maquettes that are too scale and the model to scale became an essential piece of it. Um, so quickly, I'll just walk you through, um, I'll highlight some of the kind of chapters, some of the galleries in the show. I sort of weighted this more heavily um, on the earlier stuff. Um, but again, it was 650 objects, so we could be here all night, which I promise we won't be. Um, so we had a lot of discussion about how we would begin the installation and what what did we want to do with that piece of the narrative. And I think we decided that um, we wanted to talk about the Whitney's founding, which was a unique thing. The Whitney was founded first as the Whitney Studio Club um, in Greenwich Village in 1914 by Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney, who was a New York socialite who lived uptown. Um, she was herself an artist, but had this sort of bohemian other life, if you will. And the Studio Club was originally founded as sort of more of a social space where there were some exhibitions, there were artist classes, it was a place for artists to gather. Um, and you know, it was important to us that she was an artist herself um, and that she kind of brought that sensibility. So we wanted to remind everyone that we began um, in Greenwich Village and that in a sense this new building was um, returning to, to our roots. Um, and also a reminder that her, that original thousand objects that she collected, that was a personal collection and an idiosyncratic collection in many ways was the founding collection. Um, and she had never really intended to, to found the Whitney. She tried to sell it to the Metropolitan Museum of Art at one point and they rejected it. And I think this was a moment in New York when kind of all eyes were on the European avant-garde, Alfred Bard, MoMA is, you know, heavily collecting Cubism, Picasso, and so I think she suddenly felt American art specifically needs needs a home. So she took those thousand objects and started the Whitney um, by 1931. This is a painting of Gertrude on the left. 
um, was a controversial painting at the time. Her husband hated it, the idea that she would be depicted wearing pants, which is kind of hilarious now. Uh, and then on the right is a painting of Juliana Force, who was originally Gertrude's assistant, but then became the first director and was really instrumental in kind of shaping the, the early days of the collection and shaping those early exhibitions. The other kind of obvious thing, but the thing we were happy to highlight in this early part of the show is that a woman director, first woman director and a woman founder. Um, and you know, that, that was a remarkable thing, particularly if we're talking about the 19 teens and 20s and 30s. And this is a photograph. Um, this is a painting of Ever Chin, and then next to that is Hopper, and then next to the Hopper painting are Hopper, mostly those are life class drawings. And again, we wanted to show that this was a social space. It was a place where artists came to take classes, and then an artist like Edward Hopper spent years, five years, coming to classes at the Whitney Studio Club. And it, that seemed like such an appropriate um, thing to kind of highlight given our, given our collection of hoppers. So we began the, um, the narrative with, um, on, the, on the top floor, with a kind of look at early American abstraction. Um, and, you know, one thing we really tried to do throughout the show, and the reason I'm showing you this slide, was combine icons of the collection. So the painting on the far right is Georgia O'Keeffe's Music, Pink and Blue, a, a really beloved painting of the Whitney, a pinkle painting that we often have on view. Then on the far left is a sculpture from the 1930s by Richmond Barte, um, an artist also in the Johnson collection, actually, who we collected very early on. We collected this, we acquired this work in the early 30s, shortly after it was made. But he's an artist that kind of had fallen out of our narrative. Um, so I think we were excited, but also very interested in kind of the modern experience, the connection between modern art and music, um, and how, to, how the body could kind of embody that sensibility. And so this was just one example of where we were kind of bridging the very well-known with things that we hadn't, hadn't um, you know, shown in decades and kind of forgotten about in all honesty. Another thing I think we really tried to do, again, here's O'Keeffe's music, Pink and Blue, an artist who many of you may know spent um, significant time just before she made this painting, actually, um, in South Carolina, um, with Marston Hartley, one of Marston Hartley's German officer paintings. And I think one thing we wanted to do um, and, and that we saw as a strength of our collection and kind of play out was a lot of American subject matter. O'Keeffe was looking at the natural world in the United States, eventually she goes out to Santa Fe and really responds to that environment very much and um, you know, paints New York City. And, but there are also a lot of painters, early artists, I should say, early in our collection, spending time in Europe and partly um, spent significant time in Berlin um, in, in around 1913, 1914 and, and falls in love there and makes this series of paintings, German officer paintings. And he's really responding to artists, German expressionist artists, but also to kind of the vibrancy of Berlin and the, his ability to be openly gay there in a way he wasn't here. So this slide was just to kind of to, to, to highlight this interest we had in, in kind of the, the importance of American subject matter, but also the kind of engagement with, with Europe, with European, um, with modernism in Europe, and also with kind of the, the culture in Europe at this time. And then this is a John Storr sculpture. I'm just showing this because we also really tried, this is something we haven't shown very often. Um, it's, it's a skyscraper, um, it's a sculpture of a skyscraper, and it seems so fitting for us to have this kind of against the backdrop of the city. And again, you know, we didn't have opportunities like this um, in the Bora building to kind of play with the vista of the city. And, you know, we also tried to be, um, you know, playful with the collection in certain ways while in, within the new building. One thing I should mention, these titles that I keep flashing as well that I haven't mentioned, these are the titles of the different galleries, and we, we based all the titles on works that were in the galleries, works from the collection. We didn't want to seem to be sort of superimposing our historical ideas from above. So Breaking the Prairie was the name of a painting in this space, and it was as if to signal subtly that the collection itself had really driven the installation, that, that we hadn't kind of come at the opening show with an outline, but we had looked at the collection, we kind of let the collection tell the story. What you're seeing here is a photograph by Ansel Adams, probably a familiar name to many of you, and um, prints by the artist Chiro Obata. And Obata was an artist that was born in Japan and then came and spent time 
um, in the United States, spent time out west in Yosemite, met Ansel Adams, and then actually went back to Japan to make these prints in a kind of traditional um, Japanese printing style. That, that, these are new acquisitions for us, and this was an important um, way for us to kind of expand the definition of American. The more we looked at the collection, we realized, you know, this is a complicated thing. Artists, you know, came here, who emigrated here. A lot of artists around the time of abstract expressionism, they were treated as American, obviously. But then, of course, artists have come here and spent significant time here, used American subject matter. Aren't they to be considered American as well? So this was an example of us really wanting to push, especially in this moment, in this kind of very global, um, um, connected moment, to kind of push the definition of who is an American artist. Um, and similarly along those lines, um, that's a Bill Trailer work on the right, another artist in the Johnson Collection, and um, a work by Thomas Hart Benton on the left. Benton, you know, is I think really canonized as an important early American artist um, for his terrific landscapes that he made. This is a double portrait um, that he made actually in Martha's Vineyard um, of, the, of a deaf couple, the Wests. Bill Trailer is an artist that um, spent most of his life in Montgomery, Alabama, actually, um, and didn't kind of become a successful artist much later in his life, but has largely been treated as an outsider artist, which is kind of a complicated um, term terminology that I won't go into. But th those outsider artists often kind of stayed outside of the realm of, of places like the Whitney and MoMA to generalize. And I think it was important for us in this installation not to do that. And we included artists like Trailer and James Castle alongside a kind of, as I said, canonized artist like Benton, as if to say these artists, there's no reason for them to be out of this narr narrative. The other thing I'll say is there was a desire in our show to have real geographic diversity. Um, so as much as possible, of course, the collection is in New York and has inevitably have a New York bias, to, as much as possible to have this geographic diversity. So have an artist like Trailer working in Alabama much of his life or an artist like Benton who was so engaged in a place like Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts. Those were important thing, things for us to do um, and to tease out in the collection. You know, as a reminder that you know, American art is not playing out in New York. American art is playing out throughout the country. Um, also an African-American artist working in the 60s and 70s. Um, her work has been in the White House. Um, she, she may be familiar to you. That's her work, the Reddit painting on the right, and it's next to a painting by Cy Twombly. Twombly, a great Southern artist, very well known, very canonized. I think we were excited to put Thomas in dialogue with Twombly. As if you're with us, particularly a native son of Spartanburg, so thank you. Uh, I'd also like to thank Jennifer Evans and the Chapman Cultural Center for their hospitality and making this auditorium available for tonight's event. Jennifer has long been one of the primary champions of the cultural movement in Spartanburg, and to that we're all grateful for her. In light of Jan and James' remarks about making collections matter, whether those collections are public art museums established a century ago, or smaller private enterprises seeking to make a contribution, I'm pleased to have this opportunity to make an announcement about increasing accessibility to fine art in relation to a new initiative, the Johnson Collection is undertaking with the Spartanburg County Public Libraries. This spring, one of the collection's most iconic, iconic works, and certainly its largest painting, will, will be relocated to the library's headquarters on Church Street. The painting in question, The Battle of Gettysburg, Repulse of Longstreet's Assault, captures the drama of one of the most pivotal events in American history. Created by an Englishman who immigrated to this country, the monumental Civil War painting is not the story of a northern victory or a southern defeat. Rather, it's an epic visual record of the vast military scope, the unprecedented death, and the personal interaction between war and soldiers, all at once on a canvas that measures 20 feet wide. Presently on view at Vance America's downtown building, the painting will soon be housed in a new program space currently under construction on the main library's second floor. A room that will be accessible to the community groups and the 500,000 patrons that visit the library annually. I'd like to thank our friends at the library, especially Director Todd Stevens, for their partnership on this project. And I invite you to visit the painting often once its installation is completed in May. 
Until then, I invite you to join us in the lobby for a reception honoring Jane and Jan and celebrating the vibrancy of Spartan Merciful for Community. Thank you.